हेलो दिस इज वंस अगेन एस एस त्रिपाठी वेलकमिंग यू टू दी नाइनटींथ लेक्चर ऑन बेसिक कॉन्सेप्ट इन केमिस्ट्री सोल्यूशन टू केमिस्ट्री पार्ट फोर लास्ट वीडियो वी डिस्कस अबाउट हाउ यू हैंडल स्टोक्योमेट्रिक प्रॉब्लम्स यूजिंग मोलैरिटी मेथड विदाउट यूजिंग इक्वेलेंट कॉन्सेप्ट हाउ यू कैन हैंडल द प्रॉब्लम्स ऑन स्टोक्योमेट्री वॉल्यूमेट्रिक एनालिसिस टूडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ टाइट्रेशन how volumetric analysis is usually done with two solutions by the help of an experiment called titration we will know that and we will introduce we will understand how equivalent concept can also be used to solve problems on analysis on volumetric analysis sample analysis let's start you know already we 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 had developed the concept uh, the equivalent mass of a substance may it be an element may it be a compound may it be an oxidizing agent or reducing agent may may it be a, any a uh, base acid or salt used in a metathesis or non redox reaction the, the the very very important n factor or the x factor with which uh, the molecular mass uh, to be divided the molar mass is to be divided to get the equivalent mass that we already know and in terms of equivalent concept the number of equivalents of the two reactants should be same i remind you the famous slogan the famous slogan that we had all chemical reactions take place in equivalence that means volume of a solution a in liter into its normality we already know how to find out the normality it is the number of gram equivalents per liter of the solution that is the way of expressing the concentration when we are interested to carry out the titration experiment hold on just a bit to know how the titration experiment is conducted we will discuss in greater details the volume of the solution into the normality of the solution is the number of equivalents of one reactant so similarly if you use milliliter concept instead of taking the volume of the solution mind you this is volume of the solution not gas i had already clarified you have to meticulously uh, look to the uh, problem to the to the numerical that you are handling whether it is a, a milliliter pertaining to a gaseous volume or uh, a liquid solution volume so volume in milliliter into normality will be giving you the number of milli equivalents as we call shortly meqs of the reactant so when the two reactants a and b completely react that is called the com the exact equivalence when they exactly react with each other then the two equivalents should be same v1 n1 is equal to v2 n2 the number of milli equivalents will be same number of equivalents will be same you learn to know that in terms of moles these may not be same often they are not because that depends on the stoichiometry the balanced equation whether it is 2 is to 3 or 1 is to 3 or 5 is to 8 like that but in terms of equivalence it is always 1 is to 1 x is to x right so that is the advantage of handling a particular problem in terms of equivalence and b1 i had already told you the volume of 
uh, a solution A having normality N1 and V2 uh, and N1 is the normality of the same solution A, uh, V2 is the volume of the solution B and N2 is the normality of the solution B. That's the slogan B1 N1 is equal to V2 N2. That is the slogan of a titration experiment. Now see, solving problems by molarity method, we had already done that. Let us compare this with the normality method. B1 N1 is equal to V2 N2. We can solve a solution stoichiometry problem. Problem means numerical. I'm, 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 uh, that, that means numerical by molarity method, even if the concentration data is given in normality. If you know the n factor, you know how to convert normality into molarity and vice versa. So, for example, this is a, 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 a problem. What volume of hydrogen peroxide uh, uh, solution 0.2 n is the normality? needed to completely reduce 200 ml of deci normal deci means 0.1 n by 10 uh, deci means 1 by 10 deci normal potassium dichromate solution in presence of acid solve this problem both by molarity and normality methods that means if you know the n factor then you convert this decinormal 0.1 n into corresponding m moles per liter and similarly uh, if you know the n factor let us let us now talk about discuss about you can hold on uh, this uh, pause the video and tell me in acidic medium potassium dichromate goes to chromium 3 plus so plus 6 to plus 3 so the change is 3 per atom uh, so the total change uh, n factor is the total change in oxidation number or the number of electrons lost or gained here the number of electrons gained per molecule or per ion dichromate ion is equal to 2 into 3 per 1 chromium the change is 3 and per 2 chromiums change is 6 so the n factor is 6 here and if you see what happens to hydrogen peroxide as a reductant this is the oxidant and this is the reductant and you remember from the LOC codes that hydrogen peroxide is oxidized to oxygen. Now what is the n factor? A peroxide this is minus 1 goes to 0. So the change is 1 per atom so the n factor here in this redox reaction is equal to 2 into 1 2 because there are two oxygen atoms and for one oxygen atom change is 1 so the total change is 2 so if you know this you can convert normality into molarity have a look I have already done the solution for you just have a glance the n factor of potassium dichromate is 6 and therefore 0.1 n is nothing but 0.1 by 6 m because molarity as I told you is numerically a lower number if molarity and normality are not same right so by 6 n factor per hydrogen peroxide is 2 so 0.2 n hydrogen peroxide solution that is given in the in the problem is 0.2 by 2 it is 0.1 m so the molarity now are obtained now the solution whose volume as well as molarity is given is to be attacked is to be taken first so the product of b1 into m1 that is the number of moles or millimoles so 200 milliliters is given in the problem of uh, potassium dichromate into its molarity is this much right so it is 3.333 millimoles because it is easier to uh, tackle the problem in millimoles or milliequivalents than in moles or equivalents because this millimoles milliequivalents will be a uh, n number which will be easy to add easy to subtract not 
the num number of moles, number of equivalents, which often comes as a very small value, 0 0.01, 0 0.005. So to, to manipulate, a, you know, addition, subtraction in these smaller decimal values will be really, uh, will involve a little bit of, uh, you know, a risk factor in uh, manual calculation. So it's always advisable to handle these problems with milli concept, milli moles, milli equivalents. But the choice is yours. You may not adopt the milli concept. You can use equivalent number of equivalents, number of moles, no problem. Now let us balance this equation because you know when you are solving by molarity method you have to write the equation perfectly. At least the two reactants and the main product. Even you can go for the ionic equation. Even you can bypass other uh, products. Take only if a particular element is you know uh, sustained, persisted uh, without disproportionation, you can apply the POAC concept to that particular uh, reactant. Right? So you, uh, we have balanced this equation by any method that you have learned in LOC, in language of chemistry codes, uh, your, the, uh, the oxidation number from plus 6 to plus 3, the change is, uh, total change is 6, I had already multiplied before 6, and the change in factor is 2, 2, and then I balance it by normal heat and trial method after that, then I I, I simplified uh, to the this equation 1, 4, 3, 1, 1, 3, 7. That's the balanced equation. So this two geometric relationship between potassium dichromate and potassium dichromate and uh, hydrogen peroxide is 1 is to 3. So if one millimole reacts with three millimoles, then 3.333 millimoles will react with 10 millimoles, right? So once we know the number of uh, moles or millimoles of the other reactant, the volume of the other reactant solution will be the number of millimoles by molarity because you know the volume of the solution in, 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 in milliliter into its molarity gives you the number of millimoles. So the volume of the solution in milliliter will be the number of millimoles by molarity 0.10 millimoles by 0.1 is the molarity that we have already done that comes to 100 ml solution. So this rigorous, I mean, uh, lengthy process can be condensed, shortened by the normality or equivalent concept. See, V1, N1 is equal to V2, N2. You know, the, uh, the normality values are given. Even if the molarities had been given, then we could have back converted into normality by multiplying with the same N factor with the molarity. So, but here in this question, you are given normality. So, x, the volume of the solution that you are going to determine into its normality is equal to volume of potassium dichromate solution into its normality, decinormal, so it is coming 100 ml. So, see how easy it is to uh, take up, to tackle this type of uh, problem by normality method or equivalent concept. Now, we shall see oh, how we can find out these volumes. That I have already sounded to you, the experiment that is conducted is the titration or what is called volumetric analysis. A part, a part of volumetric analysis where you are dealing with the, the aqueous volumes, the solution volumes and trying to identify or to estimate a particular component in a, in a compound, whether it is a 
pure compound or an impure compound or it is in a mixture. This is the analysis of a sample. You are carrying out uh, a volumetric analysis. You are preparing a solution or at some point you are using the, the solution the, the, of a particular um, reagent uh, and you are trying to react with the sample or you are making the solution of the sample if it is soluble uh, in water and you are reacting with other solution. So these are volumetric analysis. Our main purpose is to estimate quantitatively the amount of the substance or the percentage composition or the percentage of purity and all that. Right? The titration experiment is very, very handy. If you have, haven't done in your schools yet, then I will tell you in minor details how you perform the titration experiment using two solutions and two volumes and two concentrations. Let me read out. Just focus on what I am reading out. Volume of one reactant A solution having, unknown, having known concentration which completely react with a volume of another solution B having unknown concentration is determined by titration experiment. In titration experiment, a known volume say 10 ml or 20 ml or 25 ml of say a solution B whose concentration is not known, we are going to determine is taken in a conical flask with the help of a pipette. That particular device, small uh, device, I'll show you that is called a pipette. This is the British English, this is the American English pipette. This solution is called analyte, analyte solution or sometimes titrand D. But let's call it analyte, whose normality or whose concentration we are going to measure, determine experimentally and that is titration. Few drops of indicator is added to the analyte, this solution to exhibit a particular color. You know, indicators, if you have not heard this before, let me tell you, indicators are dyes, colored dyes. You will learn what are dyes, if you have not yet, which are added to a particular acid or base or an oxidant or reductant to develop certain distinct color, say blue or yellow or pink, whatever. And when the reaction is complete, exactly complete, and you have a, a drop excess of the other reactant, a drop, a negligible excess of the other reactant, it will show a completely different color. There will be a sharp color change when the exact equivalence is achieved by experiment. So, titration experiment is carried out with the help of an indicator like methyl orange, methyl blue, methyl red, phenolphthalein, litmus, so on and so forth. I'll tell you a list of uh, indicators which are common in titration experiments. Right? So a drop of a few drops, not more, it will, it will be very, very, uh, you know, troublesome if you add a large amount of uh, indicator to develop a very, very, you know, deep color and it will not be useful at all. So a few drops of indicator, maybe two drops or one drop, indicator is added to the analyte and so you, you find, you see a distinct color. The solution of other reactant whose concentration is already known is taken in a burette in another device. I'll show you. Burette. This is called the titrant. T, 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 T. Titrant. This is analyte. This is titrant. So the analyte is taken in a conical flask with the help of a pipette. I'll show you everything. And the titrant is taken in a burette, a long tube closed at 
uh, open at one end and the other end uh, has a has a control system where you can uh, add the titrant as per your wish have a look the titrant is slowly added to the analyte till the equivalence is reached the titrant is slowly added this is indicated by a sharp color change of the indicator this is called the end point the end of the experiment end of titration is called the end point of titration multiple experiments are done you know not one experiment will suffice that may give you a wrong result because you have oversought uh, oversought the equivalence point right so therefore multiple experiments are done with the same pair of solutions solutions from their respective stock solutions till the exact volume of the titrant the exact volume of the titrant needed to completely and exactly react with the known volume of analyte is determined from the calibration of the burette in you know, a burette has a calibration and that calibration is uh, you know small divisions are 0.1 maximum you can have a smallest division of 0.1 uh, that uh, you can measure so so from the calibration of the burette the burette readings you can know how much of the titrant has been added during the uh, reaction till a complete equivalence is achieved this volume of the titrant is called the titer value is called the titer value and then v1 n1 is equal to v2 n2 that principle is followed to find the normality of the unknown so it doesn't matter which one is unknown one of them is unknown so this supposing one this is measured by pipet 20 ml 25 ml 10 ml this is known which is taken in the conical flask as analyte and supposing this normality is not known supposing we have to determine volume of the titrant is determined experimentally from the burette readings from the burette readings we shall see that this is known from the experiment normality of the uh, titrant is already known to you i'll tell you how it is already known so the only unknown uh, parameter that can be determined by this principle v1 and 1 is equal to v2 and 2 have a look you know i really am grateful to the prentice hall incorporated from whose source i have brought this uh, this vast you know prentice hall is uh, known for its uh, contribution to the field of academics and i have brought it from the google source to show you what is uh, a pipet look like this is a pipet a glass small narrow glass tube with a pointed tip where you take exact amount of or volume of a solution that is analyte solution now there is a there is a mark in the glass at the top supposing here so you have to suck raise the liquid volume from the stock solution i'll show you up to up to this mark up to this mark very carefully and i'll show you how then this is the releasing part this say 20 ml exactly 20 ml solution of acid say for example acid is the analyte in this case we do not know the normality of acid so you, we take that acid Uh, in the conical flask with the help of a pipet this is a pipet 20 ml pipet so you will release these contents into the conical flask and just at the end when all is released just give a tip uh, just tap it with a sound tak 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 three times that's enough no need to blow the residual quantity of solution which is accumulated at the at the bottom part 
You know, the calibration has been done in such a way that the small little portion that you are going to neglect to, to, to uh, exclude will not be counted in that 20 ml or 25 ml. So with this care, precaution, you already have uh, taken the analyte and then add a drop-up indicator. When you add a drop-up indicator, it will develop, say, blue color, for example. For example. Or say, it is, it is colorless. It doesn't give any color. Say, penolphthalein uh, will not give any color in acidic medium. So, it's colorless, for example then this is what we call the butate is a long uh, narrow but 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 broader than the pipette uh, tube glass tube open at one end and the other end is controlled by a, a a knob by a switch where you can open it and release the solution and you can close it to stop the release so here you take a base, for example, sodium hydroxide, which is, uh, whose concentration normality is already known. So when you know the concentration of a certain solution accurately, these are called standard solutions. If you do not know, then you cannot uh, call it a standard solution. Rather, you say that I am going to standardize a solution. For example, in this case, the sulfuric acid, or say the acid, we don't know what is the acid. The acid solution is to be standardized, is to be standardized, means to determine the exact uh, concentration, normality by titration method. Now, we take the help of a base, say sodium hydroxide, whose concentration is known, and we fill up the entire uh, space of the burette may not be at the at the initial position doesn't matter to bring it to the zero level this is the calibration starts here zero and zero say one between zero to one there are 10 divisions so you can point one point two point three that much you can do not beyond that you can't be correct beyond uh, that so anyway so you you fill the burette with the uh, the titrant this solution is called the titrant whose concentration is known. Now, it looks blue, but, but never mind, it's not blue. It is a colorless solution. It may be a colored one, but in case of a base solution, it is often colorless, right? Then you start adding. We have already added uh, a, a drop of indicator or two drops of indicator. Then slowly release, release the volume, I mean the solution of the titrant into the conical flask into the analyte and constantly give at every addition you give a swirling motion uh, to the solution so that they will mix thoroughly you will find uh, the color of the solution will be discharged i mean uh, there will be no uh, there will be no different color the same color will per persist Initially, you may, fight, uh, you may find at the point where you add, there might be some uh, new color. But once you shake it, swirl it, you will find the original color of uh, that uh, dye. I mean that indicator, what, what was initially there will be uh, revived, right? And you continue to add till you find at the last drop, at the last part, you have to be very, very careful add the titrant in a drop wise manner till the last drop drastically changes the color from say blue to pink or say from colorless to pink because uh, in uh, basic solution phenolphthalein gives a pink color so it becomes pink one drop of excess one drop so the error that you are going to make by adding only one drop of excess uh, titrant will be neglected. But if you add more drops, become careless, add more drops. And often in the first experiment, often what you get is a erroneous result because you always overshoot the 
end point doesn't matter you record it you record it and once you know this is the tighter value from the you know you take the difference between this is the final reading and this is the initial reading and the difference will give you the tighter value so once you know the rough tighter value in the first test in the first experiment then you repeat the same experiment with the same stock solutions and you will find the exact value in the second third fourth you have to find exact values where uh, the uh, readings i mean the values will be matching if you perform three experiments same values will be getting same tighter values so until that point you continue to repeat the experiment carefully and towards the end you become uh, careful to add uh, you know the tight trend solution in a drop wise manner one drop close swirl it give a swirling motion sec it see if, if there is if there is any color change no add one drop sec see till only one drop excess will make the drastic color change and that is called the end point and equivalence exact equivalence has to happen at the end point has to happen in the end point so end point and equivalence equivalence of the reaction has to have to appear together simultaneously now see the detail detail procedure this is a pro pipette uh, in our times when uh, we were uh, students particularly in countries like india we were not having this uh, device to suck the solution from a stock stock solution we were using our our mouth to suck the solution uh, and there was a heavy risk uh, it might enter into our mouth our buccal cavity and might come i mean go inside our uh, system digestive system so that was always a risk if you are not careful so nowadays uh, devices which are called pro pipettes are available so many types by rubber, rubber types and this is not a rubber type so you can suck it with the help of this device from the stock solution this is the real pipette this is the pro pipette and it was up to this mark and then it is released now the same pro pipette can be used to release by pushing or by switching on the appropriate button you release these contents say 20, 20 ml uh, present in the pipette uh, into the conical flask which is called the analyte right once you uh, take the exact volume of the analyte solution you add a drop or two drops of indicator to have a particular color say blue then you add the the tight and, and you take the tight trend solution in the burette you completely fill it or to whatever level you can bring and note the initial reading and then start the titration till the end point i have already explained and then you kind find an exact color change right an exact color change that is the end point now let me let me tell you what are the different three types of titrations if you are having a titration of acid with a base or vice versa this is called acid base titration and formally it was called acidimetry alkalimetry sometimes you'll find in the literature acidimetry alkalimetry right and the other titration is redox where you are using uh, a reducing agent a reductant maybe are they are they uh, as as analyte and an oxidant as the titrant whatever right so that is redox titration and also you will find we'll discuss the type of or the the indicator that we'll be using for a particular redox reactions they're not all same different indicators are used for different uh, redox uh, titrations and the other one is a precipitation titration which is very very uncommon 
but you can have a particular analyte say sodium chloride as analyte and add slowly a silver nitrate solution from a burette till the end point there also you have to take some indicator to show you the equivalence point this is titration i mean precipitation titration now i will be tempted to 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 show you uh, that this is video from the youtube done uh, very meticulously by one teacher and i would like to congratulate him for his uh, endeavor to prepare a very very short video and i'm going to this was in the youtube uh, uh, domain and i have used this congratulating this uh, author the youtuber who created this and i am grateful to him that i am showing his video 4 minutes duration uh, how these titration experiments are done here it goes before filling the burette we should make sure we place a small glass funnel in the top we should also make sure we've got the rest of the equipment we need including solutions distilled water a suitable indicator in this case be not failing a 25 milliliter volumetric pipette three clean conical flasks and a pipette filler two examples of these are shown on the screen here we're going to use a more traditional rubber bulb pipette filler which should be attached carefully to the end of the pipette it's important to hold the pipette close to the end attached to the pipette filler to reduce the risk of breakage. Now we can press the appropriate button on the pipette filler and gently squeeze the bulb to expel the air. And we're now able to draw up some of our solution into the pipette. We place the pipette into the solution and we press the appropriate button on the filler and this draws the solution into the pipette. Initially we're going to take more solution than we need. Here you can see the line on the pipette and you can see the solution is clearly above that. Now we can gently remove the rubber bulb and we place our thumb over the end of the pipette. Now by gently moving our thumb we can release the solution in a carefully controlled manner until the bottom of the meniscus is touching the line on the pipette. Once the solution is on the... Now, now let me tell you that in acute solution you have a meniscus which is concave like this. So this, you have to release the solution to the extent that this lower meniscus of the aqueous solution, which is concave, will touch this, will touch uh, this mark. Because there is a mark in every pipette. And you release the remaining portion, the excess portion, to the extent that the lower meniscus will touch the mark that the extra portion which will be there here in the in the in the in the in the, in the uh, curvature exactly that has to be disregarded now here it goes cubed of our solution this can now be transferred to a clean conical flask we allow the solution to run under gravity into the flask by removing our thumb yeah, it should be it should be allowed to run under gravity. It's important to recognize that the pipette is calibrated in such a way that you should always touch the pipette onto the surface of the liquid in the flask to ensure that the correct volume has been transferred. There will always be a small amount of liquid left in the pipette, but that's meant to be there, so don't worry about it. One safe way of filling a burette is to clamp it and place the clamp stand on top of a stool. This allows you to look at the burette at eye level. Now see, you will be given this is a long burette where you are adding uh, periodically when it is exhausted the same analyte solution from the stock with the help of a conical, I mean a funnel, right? Guidance on what's expected of you at this point. After checking the tap on the burette is closed, you can proceed to fill the burette. It's sensible to lift the funnel out slightly as this prevents spluttering of the solution.
It's not essential to fill the burette to the zero line, although you must make a note of the burette reading for later on. Before carrying out the titration, we need to add a few drops of indicator, which in this case is phenol thallium. It's important not to add more than two or three drops of indicator as you don't need it. Now we can carry out a rough titration, sometimes called an overshoot titration, to find out roughly how much of our other solution is needed to neutralise the solution in the conical flask. This is done by adding the solution from the burette until we see a permanent colour change. We can now work out the volume of solution which we added from the burette by noting the final burette reading and performing a simple subtraction. In this case we've added just over 16 centimetres cubed altogether, so we can reasonably expect our accurate titrations to require somewhere in the region of 15 centimetres cubed of solution. So we're going to add about 14 centimetres cubed by going very quickly from 19 centimetres cubed to 33 centimetres cubed on the burette. And the last part has to be done very carefully. The first one is, was the rough reading. See the solution running in quickly. In this case, uh, the overshoot has happened and 16. Added those 14 centimetres cubed, we can adjust the tap on the burette to add the remaining solution very slowly in a dropwise fashion. The dropwise manner, the last part. You have this to should be continued with regular swirling until the colour has been permanently discharged. Only one drop. Now we can work out accurately how much acid has been added by performing a subtraction and the experiment should then be repeated until concordant results are obtained. Right. That's uh, the thing I wanted to show you if you are a beginner and not seen the experiment or not conducted in your, in, your, in your school, then it will be definitely very, very uh, rewarding to experience that here. Now, for acid-base titrations, we normally use these indicators, methyl orange, which gives a pink color in acid, yellow color in alkali, methyl red, red, yellow, litmus, red, blue. No, hardly we use uh, litmus for our uh, laboratory purpose, but you can use it. Phenolphthalein, uh, which is colorless in acidic medium and red in alkaline medium or pink in alkaline medium, right? So this, these are some common acid-base indicators, acid-base titration indicators. Similarly, if while you are carrying out redox titrations, you have different indicators. For example, you are handling uh, a redox reaction involving KMnO4, which is a purple color. So no external indicator is required because KMnO4 itself is an indicator. It's called a self-indicator. For example, you are taking ferrous sulfur solution as analyte which is light green, doesn't matter. But once you add potassium permanganate, its color will vanish. Once you swirl it, its color will vanish. And at the end point, you get the permanent purple color. That is the end point. Similarly, while you are using potassium dichromate as, as an oxidant in the, in the burette, you have to use a, in the reductant, uh, any reductant uh, solution, you have to use some specific uh, indicator just remember these are uh, a couple of indicators and two indicators i've given for potassium dichromate to be used with reductant that is diphenylamine n phenyl anthranilic acid of similar type and you forget about its structure no need that gives green color uh, to the reductant solution and once it is complete the, the exact equivalence point happens slightly one drop over soot will change the color uh, from green to purple so that is the end point and we have iodimetry we shall see well sodium thiosulfate will be used as a titrant to uh, reduce iodine which is taken as the analyte as oxidant so there you have to add starch as indicator which turns uh, blue with uh, iodine uh, that 
I, blue color ultimately will discharge completely colorless at the end point when exact equivalence of sodium thiosulfate solution is added. So we will be uh, and also in precipitation titration I give you one example where sodium chloride is taken as the analyte and the conical flask and silver nitrate is taken as a titrant you continue you will get a white precipitate every time shake it I mean swirl it and at the end point and you are, have to use a drop a drop or two drops of potassium chromate to the sodium chloride solution as indicator which will be uh, looking blue, I mean sorry, yellow. So that potassium chromate, not dichromate, potassium chromate solution is the indicator which uh, renders the solution, sodium chloride solution, yellow. But at the end point, it will change the color to reddish brown due to the formation of silver chromate which is reddish brown. The excess one drop of silver nitrate solution will produce silver chromate which is uh, reddish brown. So then you stop further adding the titrant. Now we close this session and we continue uh, this session in the other part in the other half while we solve problems uh, on you by using this V1N1 a, a, in A is equal to V2N2 the equivalent concept and compare how easy sometimes uh, uh, to solve problems by V1, N1, V2, N2. But once you know the normality, uh, you can as well convert to molarity. You know the N factor uh, and carry out the calculation on the basis of molarity. But for a single reaction experiment, when you are very, uh, you know, exact in, in, in the knowledge of N factor, it is always better to go by equivalent concept V1 and 1 is equal to V2 and 2 rather than in a roundabout way uh, you know touching your nose instead of like this you touch your nose like this it is uh, a time consuming process on economical process right so we close to this this session now but just after a bit I will be uh, continuing particularly this part the part 4 as I call it part 4 of uh, volumetric analysis and uh, at the end I must tell you that have you subscribed to my channel if you are continuously uh, remaining with me I'm sure from the likes not not only likes but the number of views that I am uh, finding in my channel is, uh, is uh, uh, though not very large because uh, it takes time and um, I'm not keen in promoting it so it doesn't matter, it takes, let, let it take uh, as long as possible. But quite a sizable number is viewing. If that is the case, then have you subscribed to my channel? If not, please do it. It's not costing you anything. It will simply uh, help you in getting all my videos whenever I publish. Instantly you get the message. And at the same time it will benefit in the source YouTube which will recognize uh, our work uh, and I can be rewarded by, for that so and also if you like this video don't hesitate to click on the like button and I find many of you many of you are watching viewing but are not getting time or not uh, you know uh, not uh, keen in clicking the like button although you really liked it I can feel it so please don't do that also to motivate me to do more and more for you click the like button bye bye see you soon